Matthew chapter 24. If you was here last week, or if you watched last week, we started a study on eschatology, which is a study for the end times. And last week we brought out the next great event in prophecy is the rapture of the church, or the translation of the saints, or the catching away of the saints, uh, depending on what camp you're in, what you call it. Uh, their folks won't call it the rapture because rapture is not mentioned in the Bible but because we're caught up together they'll call it the catching away of the saints uh, even though all three terms are uh, implied by the Bible uh, but the rapture or the catching away of the saints is uh, the next great event we brought that out and everybody was real excited about that till we got to talking about what happens next and that's the judgment seat of Christ and uh, to be honest with you, you shouldn't shout on that. We're all going to give an account, uh, and we're going to be judged uh, according to the Word of God. And you'll give an account of yourself uh, to the Lord Jesus Christ. And uh, you've heard me say over the years, you know, a lot of people love singing them songs about heaven, them streets of gold, and, and walls of jasper, and gates of pearl, and friends, oh, that's a blessing, that's coming. But I don't get too excited about them songs because I know long before we ever put one foot on one golden brick in the streets of glory, we've got to go to the judgment seat of Christ. We brought the judgment seat of Christ out last week. And then we concluded last week with the marriage supper of the Lamb. And hallelujah, we're going to a feast and not the fast. And uh, we'll be with the Lord. And I don't know what will be served, but it'll be uh, like nothing you've ever tasted. Uh, and it will be wonderful, but more important than that is who we will feast with. We'll feast with the darling Son of God Himself, and we'll be with the Bride of Christ. Uh, those that uh, have gone on before, those we've served with, the uh, loved ones that's gone on, the, uh, the great apostles will be there. Uh, uh, folks we've read about in the Scriptures in the New Testament, they'll be there. And uh, uh, what a tremendous tremendous celebration that wedding feast will be you know weddings are always excited they're always a, a, a celebration and they're just a small token of what that day really will be and uh, that's where we left off last week um, while those events are going on when the church is taken out of here we appear at the judgment seat of Christ and then we get to celebrate at the wedding feast. Uh, there are events happening on this earth. And that's where we'll turn our attention to starting tonight. In Matthew chapter 24, if you remember last week, I told you Matthew was not written to the church. It was written to, anybody remember? The Jews. And it's because the Jews required a sign. The Greeks sought after wisdom. And in Matthew 24, this is a sign to the Jews for the end times. Much of Matthew 24, Jesus is teaching on prophecy out of the Old Testament. Uh, if I had a chart I could show you, the Jews, the Pharisees, the Sadducees, the scribes, uh, the Sanhedrin council, the hierarchy of Judaism... They constantly studied the scriptures. If you was a Pharisee, you had the first five books of the Bible committed to memory. But they had a real problem. They only saw the mountaintops of prophecy. They only focused on the prophecies that dealt with the Messiah coming. And when he came back to this earth to rule and reign from the throne of David, that's all they focused on. They didn't focus on the valleys of prophecy. They didn't see the prophecy that before Messiah come, he'd be born of a virgin and he would be born in Bethlehem and that he would die the terrible death of the cross. I mean, we go back and read Isaiah 53. I got news for you. The Jews had Isaiah 53. They just ignored it. They, that was in the valley of their, their heights of prophecy. They liked that stuff talking about the Messiah coming and delivering them, especially from Roman rule. But they didn't see a lot of the prophecy concerning the nation of Israel and what she'll have to do through judgment. 
And so Matthew 24, the Lord is giving them signs dealing with prophecy they should have known, but they chose to ignore. Can I say they still choose to ignore it? And so Matthew 24 is a, is a, a lesson from the Lord to the Jews on what will happen in the end times. I want to pick up our reading tonight in verse number 20. I'm sorry, let's look in, yeah, verse 20. He says, But pray ye that your flight be not in the winter, neither on the Sabbath day. For then shall be great tribulation, such as not since the beginning of the world to this time, no, nor ever shall be. I want you to take verse 22, and I want you to underscore that verse. Again, Jesus tells the Jews that in verse 22, and except those days should be shortened, there, or I'm, I'm sorry, verse uh, 21, for then shall be great tribulation, such as was not since the beginning of the world to this time, no, nor, e nor ever shall be. If I read that correctly, Jesus is saying to the Jews, there's coming a tribulation period that is so horrible, there's never been a, a, a time like it since the beginning of the world, nor will there ever be a time like that time. Let's pray. Father, we love you. We thank you for the good testimonies. We thank you for the good singing. We're thankful for this season we celebrate. Lord, we do pray for uh, Miss Mary and Miss Cinda's family, you'd continue to comfort them in these days. Lord, I pray for Miss Billy's request uh, for Jason, who's on a ventilator in Pittsburgh with COVID, not doing well. I pray you'd touch him. We pray your will would be done in his life. Father, we pray for Brother James and his ongoing situation from being hit by a car. And Father, there were other prayer requests. And Father, we pray for... Miss Jackie's niece that had the baby premature, and Lord, the baby and mama seemed to be doing fine, and that's a blessing. I pray you'd continue to touch them. And there were other requests. Miss Barb had a request, and God, I pray you'd uh, uh, be with uh, uh, her uh, uh, niece, I believe it was, that has thyroid cancer and has surgery coming up on the 30th, and God, touch her and help her. And Father, others, Lord, that uh, still in our church that are sick, and some that aren't doing well, and uh, certainly our elderly and our shut-ins, God, I pray for them. Lord, it's a blessing to have Miss Sonny and Miss Brandy and Miss Samantha back with us tonight. We're thankful for that. And Lord, we're thankful, Lord, that we can come and look to the perfect law of liberty and look to the Word of God again. Lord, that we can uh, have our faith grown, and Lord, that we can certainly uh, uh, be challenged and also convicted. And God, help us, Lord, to realize that this world's winding down. And Lord, us, those of us that are saved, we're on the winning side, and we can be excited about that. But Lord, we ought to be burdened for those who are not ready to meet you. Now, Father, help us tonight. Enlighten our minds. Edify the saints of God. Instruct us in ways of righteousness. And help us, Lord, to shine as lights, uh, brighter than any Christmas tree or any lights on any building. Help us to shine in this dark world and let folks know that Jesus saves. Lord, have your will and way. We'll bless you and praise you for it. For it's in Jesus' wonderful name we ask these things. Amen and amen. Tonight, we're going to look at the Great Tribulation period. The Great Tribulation period. Now, when studying eschatology, there really are three schools of thought when it comes uh, to the end times. When it comes to how the course of events will unfold. There are those who are amillennialist. An amillennialist, uh, they hold to the thought process that we're living in the millennium now. And they believe that there is no millennial reign of Christ. Uh, matter of fact, if you talk to them and you show them verses dealing with Christ ruling and reigning for a thousand years, uh, the most of them will either 
just not even try to answer it because they, they're not equipped for it. But those that do, they will say, well, that happened during the Garden of Eden. I don't read anywhere in Genesis chapter number 2 or 3 where Jesus came and sat on the throne of David for a thousand years during the Garden of Eden. Uh, again, in our study, we want to make certain we rightly divide the Word of God. We just don't want to make something up and throw it somewhere. But our millennials believe that we are uh, living in a millennium right now. They also believe in a general judgment. They believe that when Christ comes back, he's just going to judge everybody at the same time. Yet, we brought out last week, there's a judgment seat of Christ. There's also the great white throne judgment that we'll get to and discuss. Uh, can I say in Matthew 25, we find that Jesus is going to judge the nations when he rules and reigns from the throne of David. And to be honest with you, there are five judgments. Mm, there's not one general judgment. And so they're, they're off on their theology. Uh, most uh, 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 folks don't understand, but uh, Martin Luther, the reformer, was an amillennialist. And most of the Protestant churches that came out of the Reformation taught amillennialism. Uh, Catholicism, Catholics, tend to be amillennialist. Uh, and so do most missionary Baptists and most free will Baptists. They tend to be amillennialists because, uh, let's just be honest with you, they don't get into Scriptures much. They don't want to get into Scriptures much. It challenges them, so it's easier for them to say that it doesn't exist than to study it and rightly divide it. If you go in most missionary or free will Baptist churches, uh, they'll read a text and then they'll, they'll spit and slobber and hoop and holler and amen themselves for about 20, 25 minutes, never say anything, but they had a good time because emotionally they felt good for being in church. Uh, they, too, like many uh, Pentecostal churches, most of everything is geared toward the singing, emotionalism, the preacher being loud and spit and slobbering, not in the content of what he says. Matter of fact, most missionary and free will Baptist church believe the preacher can't preach with notes. They believe he needs to be like Peter on the day of Pentecost, open his mouth, and God fills him. Yet they don't study the scriptures where Paul told Luke to bring the parchments, and they don't study the scriptures where it says, study to show thyself approved unto God, uh, and um, all kinds of things. So anyway, they don't believe in using notes. Uh, a lot of them don't call Job, Job. They call him Job. Because they don't study. They don't study at all. Therefore, when you challenge them, they'll get mad and upset, red in the face, and shut down. They don't have any problem with the preacher being a mason. Although the Bible says not uh, to be aware of those things that are done in secret. You're not to be a part of any secret society. Uh, the church is to be part of the light, not darkness. And there's a lot of things I could throw off on them. Uh, but they tend to be amillennialist. They don't believe in the end times properly because they're lazy. They don't study. Uh, or they will use their, their lack of education as a crutch, uh, and they'll look down on people that do have an education. Mm, you know, uh, listen. I just, this is one of my pet peeves in the world. I'm not talking about in 1895 or 1900. I'm talking about in 2000. In the United States of America, there is no excuse for you being ignorant. Ignorance is not a learning disability. Ignorance is laziness, not choosing to be educated. We live in the information age. If you want to learn something, you can. And when it comes to studying the Bible, there have never been as many tools available as today for studying your Bible. Between online, e-books, uh, between libraries, between all kinds, you can study the Bible if you choose to. All you really need is a good King James Bible, a good dictionary, and a concordance. You can study your Bible. The Bible says, seek and ye shall find. God will show you things if you want to know things. Or you can be lazy and be ignorant, and at the judgment seat, you'll wish you wouldn't have been. 
Okay? I don't know why I said all that, but I did. There you go. Uh, one school of thought is an amillennialist. The second school of thought are premillennialist. Uh, my dear friends, we are a premillennial church. Uh, what is premillennialist? Well, premillennialist hold to a literal scriptural interpretation of the end times. We take the Bible for what it says. We are Bible believers. And we have rightly divided the scriptures, and we believe as the Bible interprets the end times. Now, do we know everything about the end times? No. But some of it hasn't unfolded. But we have a fundamental belief of the end times. What are those fundamental beliefs? What we're teaching on? The rapture of the church. We believe in the tribulation period, which we're going to talk about tonight. We believe in the second literal coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. See, those that are amillennials believe that the rapture is the end. Well, Jesus don't come to the earth at the rapture. We rise to meet him in the air. But he is literally coming back to this earth. We'll show you that. Uh, we also believe in the thousand-year reign of Christ or the millennial reign of Christ. We believe that will happen. Then we believe the final judgment. We believe the scriptures as they were written. We take all of our doctrine from the scriptures and thank God for uh, the Bible. When Jesus was on the earth, he said he didn't come to bring peace but a sword. I told you early on, doctrine divides. When you t teach this Bible, when you rightly divide it and lay it out and teach it, it'll divide you from folks. This Bible has divided family members. It has divided communities. It has divided denominations. It's divided. The Bible's what makes the difference. And I told you as we started this study, the Bible's what makes us Baptists. I'm an independent Baptist, but more than that, I'm a Bible believer. Now, uh, premillennialism is not only held by the independent Baptists, and most independent Baptists are premillennialist. Most Southern Baptists are premillennialist. Most Church of God, I'm not talking about Mountain Holiness Church of God, most Church of God, most Assembly of God, most Pentecostal churches are premillennialist. So there's amillennialist, there's premillennialist, and then there's post-millennialist. What do they believe? They're as hokey as the amillennialist. Those that are post-millennialist, they believe that the millennium will become an increasing golden age of spiritual prosperity and that the world will eventually reach a state of righteousness and peace like never seen before. We're heading that direction, aren't we? Hmm? They say, when that's accomplished, then Christ will return. That's crazy. The Bible says, this know also in the last days perilous times shall come. Doesn't say, this know also in the last day we're all going to hold hands and sing kumbaya. Doesn't say that. Things aren't getting better, they're getting worse. Now, it amaze you who believes that people like John Calvin was a post millennialist and let me help you something Calvinism has infected independent Baptist, the independent Baptist movement and Calvin was a Presbyterian uh, and a post millennialist hmm. you know why people choose to be Calvinists because they're lazy most of the time where God's already decided who's going to heaven and who's going to hell, so all I gotta do is come to church. And I don't have to support missions, I don't have to tell anybody about Christ, and God's already got it all settled. I want to tell you, if I believe that I wouldn't even go to church. Why do I need to touch a God on me if God's already got it all worked out? No. Well, John Calvin was a post millennialist. Jonathan Edwards, that great Baptist preacher who preached sinners in the hands of an angry God, he was a post millennialist. It's one of the most emphatic messages ever preached. He read it by candlelight. And literally, 
the whole northeast of the United States was affected. They said by the time the revival that broke out because of that message ended, over a million people had gotten saved. Now, say, Brother Doug, if the guy was a post-millennialist, why did God use him? Because God winks at our ignorance. Hmm? It's not by our abilities. It's by the Spirit of God. And for such a time as this, God used that message and changed America. And I say, let me give you some others. George Whitfield, the great English preacher, was a post millennialist I've got the works of Whitfield. He was a Calvinist and a post millennialist yeah, I knew Whitfield wasn't right with God when he went to South Carolina and said, he said nobody could win these people. All it became the Bible Belt. Uh, been more churches planted out of the Carolinas than any other two states in this country. You know, so that lets you know he, he, he had some deep-rooted problems. But there, there are literally a lot of folks who are post millennials Those were just a few. All right? Uh, and then there's one more school of thought. It's really just came about the last 20, 25 years, and it's growing. A lot of people are jumping on the bandwagon of this. It was born in, in, in the Church of God movement, but a lot of Baptists are embracing it. It's called the mid-trib. I call it the mid-trib heresy. As you will find out, the tribulation period, the great tribulation period, will last seven years. I want you to understand this because when I start bringing out things, I want you to remember this. The mid-trib believe the first three and a half years aren't going to be that bad. There will be some, some heartache. But just before it gets really bad, the Lord will take his church out then. So the church is going to go halfway through the tribulation period and then taken out. Okay? So I want you to keep that in mind as we go through this. All right? Now let's talk about the tribulation. The great tribulation. Now there, there are a lot of folks who really wrestle with this because when you study the Bible, if you don't rightly divide it, you can take terms and you can make it mean whatever you want. Or if you take something out of context, it will confuse you. Now make no mistake, uh, the church does endure tribulation. We are enduring tribulation even right now. When you have elected officials tell you you're non-essential, when you're in a country that is close to the gospel and they kill you for being a Christian, we are enduring tribulation. Let me give you a verse. 1 Thessalonians 3, 4. For verily when we were with you, we told you before that we should suffer tribulation, even as it came to pass, and ye know. Paul in his day said, you're going to suffer tribulation. But what is important to know, the tribulation that the church is enduring and that the church suffers is brought about by Satan. He is doing everything he can to hurt Christians so they won't win lost people to Christ. He, he, he lost you. He knows he can never have you back. So now he wants to mess with you so you don't win anybody else. He don't care if you come to church. He don't care if you read your Bible. He don't really care if you pray as long as you don't get plugged in praying. He just don't want you to get so much God on you that you impact somebody else. So he'll let you go through a little revival meeting, and then two days afterwards he'll hit you like you've not been hit in a while. Because he wants you to lose everything God put in you. So you will endure some tribulation. You will endure some hardship. Why do you think Paul told us to endure hardness as a good soldier of Jesus Christ? The church does suffer tribulation. But we're not in the great tribulation. As we brought out in Matthew 24, the Lord is talking to the Jews. We endure tribulation. The Jews will have tribulation. Our tribulation is brought about by Satan. Their tribulation will come from God. There's a big difference. A big difference. 
So with that in mind, let's look at the Jews and the Great Tribulation. What are they suffering? What are they going through? What are they going to have to face from God? Listen, I don't like having to deal with the devil. I don't like having to go through hardship. I don't like it when public officials tell us that they don't care what the Constitution says, we're not allowed to have church. I don't like when we hear of folks being imprisoned for their faith. That all comes from Satan. I don't like it. But I'd sure rather deal with that booger than have Almighty God against me. John chapter number 1, I believe it's verse 14, tells us the Lord came unto his own, and his own received him not. But as many as received him, to them gave he power to become the sons of God, uh, even to them that call upon his name. I think it's verse 12. I, I, I say that because he came to his own, the Jews. You remember what I said? They were looking for Messiah. They wasn't looking for a guy that came out of Nazareth uh, doing a lot of miracles and telling them they needed to repent. They didn't like that. They didn't mind John the Baptist. They'd go down and get baptized. But they didn't like it when Jesus started telling them what their thoughts were. When Jesus started uh, uprooting all of their traditions that weren't scriptural. They didn't like it. They didn't like when Messiah came. He came to his own. They said, no, we don't want you. His own received him not. But as many as would receive him. Hallelujah, that's us. To them gave him power to become the sons of God, even to them to believe on his name. So we're in the family of God, but those Jews rejected him. Well, there's a price for that. Now, let me qualify this. Even though we're the bride of Christ, even though we're saved by the blood of Jesus, even though we're going to New Jerusalem, the Jews are still God's chosen people. But God's not pleased with them. So God's going to purge them. And He's going to purge them with a seven-year period called the Great Tribulation Period. Now again, look at verse number 21. For then shall be great tribulation, such as was not since the beginning of the world to this time, no, nor ever shall be. Jesus said, y'all going to suffer. There's never been a time like it. Let me give you some verses concerning the tribulation and the Jews and how God will judge them and purge them. Jeremiah chapter 30, verse number 4 says this, And these are the words that the Lord spake concerning Israel and concerning Judah. For thus saith the Lord, We have heard a voice of trembling, of fear, and not of peace. Uh-oh. What about that crowd that's always crying peace and safety? Hmm? Ask ye now, and see whether a man doth travail with child. Wherefore, do I see every man with his hands on his loins as a woman in travail, and all faces are turned into paleness? Alas, for that day is great, so that none is like it. It is even the time of Jacob's troubles, but he shall be saved out of it. Jeremiah calls it the time of Jacob's troubles, he said that man will even respond like he's in travail, like a woman with, a, with uh, giving childbirth. He said there's never been a day like it. He said, uh, but they'll be saved out of it. God's not going to annihilate Israel. He's just going to purge her. Okay? The Bible says in Ezekiel chapter 20, verse 34, And I will bring you out from the people and will gather you out of the countries wherein you are scattered with a mighty hand and with a stretched out arm and with fury poured out. And I will bring you into the wilderness of the people and there will I plead with you face to face. Now let me pause right here. When you get into the study in Revelation, you'll find that the Jews have to flee to the wilderness of fulfillment of what Ezekiel said. Let's read on in Ezekiel verse 36. He said that he, he pleaded with them face to face. Chapter 20, verse number 35, verse 36. Like as I pleaded with your fathers in the wilderness of the land of Egypt, 
So will I plead with you, saith the Lord God. And I will cause you, here it is, to pass under the rod, and I will bring you into the bond of the covenant, and I will purge you out from among you the rebels and them that trespass, trespass against me. I will bring them forth uh, out of the country where they sojourn, and they shall not enter into the land of Israel, and ye shall know that I am the Lord. Why is God going to purge them? So they'll know who he is. They didn't, they didn't know Jesus when he showed up. They're going to know the chastening rod of God. Hmm? They're going to know who God is. Ezekiel 22, again, dealing with the Jews. Verse 19, Therefore thus saith the Lord God, Because ye are all become, become dross, we would call that reprobate, tested out worthless, Behold, therefore I will gather you into the midst of Jerusalem, as they gather silver and brass and iron and lead and tin, here it is, into the midst of the furnace to blow the fire upon it, to melt it, to, so will I gather you in mine anger and in my fury, and I will leave you there and melt you. Yea, I will gather you and blow upon you in the fire of my wrath, and ye shall be melted in the midst thereof. Boy, I don't want to face that, do you? Hmm? Uh, that gives a whole different side to that lovey-dovey God that Joel Olstein's all the time talking about. Make no mistake, God is a God of love. He's a God of grace. He is long-suffering, Brother Kevin. He is tender mercy. But I want to tell you something. There comes a time when God says, enough's enough. And then you see that other side of God. The God of wrath. The God of judgment. The God that is angry with the wicked every day. Zechariah chapter 13, verse number 9 says this, And I will bring the third part through the fire, and will refine them as silver is refined, and will try them as gold is tried. They shall call on my name, and I will hear them. I will say, It is my people, and they shall say, The Lord is my God. The tribulation to purge Israel is to bring Israel back to where they acknowledge who God is. And then Daniel chapter 12, verse number 1. The Bible says, And at that time shall Michael, talking about the archangel Michael, And at that time shall Michael stand up, the great prince, which standeth for the children of thy people. And there shall be a time of trouble, such as never was since there was a nation even to that same time. And at that time thy people shall be delivered, every one that shall be found written in the book. Daniel says there's a time of trouble coming. And we didn't turn there. You can look in Malachi chapter 3, verses 1 through 3. It talks about them being refined as silver again, being melted in the furnace. And so we see that the great tribulation period has nothing to do with the church. The church will be out of here. Hmm? It has to deal with the nation of Israel and God purging Israel for Israel turning her back on Almighty God. Now, the course of events that unfold during the Great Tribulation are found in Revelation chapter 6 through chapter 19. The vast majority of the book of the Revelation deals with Israel and what will happen during the Great Tribulation period. Again, those that do not rightly divide the Scripture don't understand. In chapter 2 and chapter 3 of the book of Revelation, you find the seven messages to the seven churches. The last church is the church of Laodicea, the church that is increased with goods, that thinks she's rich when she's blind, poor, wretched, naked. And you find the last invitation, Jesus is saying, I stand outside the door and knock if any man will open up and I'll enter in and sup with him and he with me. Immediately following that, chapter 4, John sees heaven open, and he sees the church called out of here. He hears the Lord say, come up hither, there's the trumpet sound. And that's the picture of the rapture in chapter 4. In chapter 5, there's the great celebration around the throne where uh, uh, all the nations and kindreds and tongues of people uh, cry, Worthy is the Lamb that was slain to receive honor and riches and glory. And we all shout when we read Revelation chapter 5. Starting in chapter 6, you'll see the wrath and the judgment that God will pour out 
on this earth. And that lasts up through almost the entire chapter number 19. All right? Now, turn with me to Daniel chapter number 9. The book of Daniel chapter number 9. Really, I, I, I'm going to allude to the Antichrist. I thought I'd get to the Antichrist, but the more I got to studying on this, the bigger it got. We'll get to the Antichrist next week, okay? There's so much happening even in our society. I want to do a whole lot more on that. I will just tell you this. In order to buy and get and sell and, and be able to you know, have, to have trade and commerce during the great tribulation period, you've got to take the mark of the beast. The Bible makes it clear the mark of the beast is in the forehead or in the hand. Now back in the 70s, I told you this many times when I first got saved, there was a lot of preaching on the rapture, on the end times, because the, the world was going through the oil crisis. Uh, everybody thought for sure Henry Kissinger was going to be the Antichrist. And, and everybody thought this thing's in turmoil and there's a lot of preaching on the end times uh, and as a young 10 and a half, 11, 12 year old boy I'm thinking well, who in the world would walk around with a tattoo on their head and on their forearm you know, or on their, on, their, on their forearm or, or on their hand yeah but nowadays that ain't no big deal but see there's been a lot of technology it's not going to be a tattoo it's going to be a chip they started chipping pets about 10 years ago. Little Fido runs off. They can pull up and find out where Fido is. That worked so good that starting five, six, seven years ago, they started doing that to children. So many children ended up on milk cartons. Well, you can have a chip implanted into your child, and if somebody abducts your child, we can find them in a matter of minutes. You remember Adam Walsh, what happened, and you know, all that went on, and everybody scared that your child was going to get abducted, and, and folks started having their children chipped. Our military personnel have been chipped for a long time. If they get killed behind enemy lines, we know where to find their body. They've been chipping people for a long time. I find it amazing that in the current pandemic, that Bill Gates, the great scientist and doctor that he is, wants to develop a vaccine that, that chips everybody. So we can know if you've been vaccinated or not, so I can know if I need to be around you or not. And also, all your records could be put on that chip. You, you know how much information they can store on a microchip? My dad was a computer programmer for 30 years. He started out when computers started out. He told me when they went to 4K memory, they thought they were in heaven. I remember going to work with him as a kid, and the computer took up a whole room. When I got my computer programming degree, and they brought out the microprocessors, which you and I would know today as a PC, I thought these things never take off. They're too slow. Boy, I missed the mode on that. I remember nine and a half inch floppy disk. The printer had big rolls of paper. It had lines all over it. I remember all that's what I That's why I studied computers. Why I'm ignorant today. I don't know all that stuff. Do you know the room-filled computer that my dad worked on that ran GE where Peter works? Because he worked there for a long time. Ran uh, 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 Cincinnati Bell West out in, out in Omaha and all over the country. All those computers. Do you know that phone you got in your pocket is more powerful than that computer that used to take up a room? Do you realize that phone is so powerful because it has microchips in it? Stores all that information. And they want to put all your medical records on a microchip, insert it in your body, so they don't have to make sure Epic's up and running and everything. They can just scan you know all about you. You're in a car wreck, they'll scan you, know all about you, know what you're allergic to, know everything about you, pull up your records right now. Boy, it makes sense to the natural man. Do you know why they're calling for folks to stay six feet apart in social distancing? I mean, this COVID virus is so intelligent. I mean, you go through a drive through and they've got the plexiglass only takes up half the window. It only knows to hit that, you know. And, and but, you know, it, it knows it can only go five and a half feet. And that, you know, no. You know why they want you six feet apart? 
so your chip don't interact with whoever's six feet closer to you with their chip because they can't discern which chip is which from the satellite that they're looking at. Friends, if you think you've got 20 years before the Lord comes back, you sure don't do much studying. Go back and get the message the Lord gave me back in March on inching toward the Antichrist. And tell me the Lord didn't give me that message back then and see what's all transpired since last March. Hmm? So what are you trying to say, preacher? Well, let's, let's, let's look in Daniel chapter number 9. We're talking about the great tribulation period tonight. Now again, if you just read the Bible and you don't study the Bible, you'll just be somebody who read the Bible. But if you want to study the Bible and learn some things, you'll find out what all this means. Daniel was blessed by God to see things in the future. John was called up to the third heaven to see things in the future. And when you study Revelation and Daniel hand in hand, you'll, you'll, you'll draw some conclusions as to the future. In Daniel chapter number 9, I'm going to read several verses. But I want you to see what's going on here. This is a vision God gave Daniel concerning Israel. And this happened uh, 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 over 500 years before Christ came on the scene. So we're talking about 2,600 years ago. All right? Now listen to me. Verse number 20. And whiles I was speaking and praying and confessing my sin. By the way, you want to hear from God? Start talking to God and start confessing your sin. He's liable to speak to you too. But if you've got sin in your life, he's not going to speak to you. He's not even going to hear your prayers. <coughs> he says, And while I was speaking and praying and confessing my sin and the sin of my people Israel and presenting my supplication before the Lord my God uh, for the holy mountain of my God, yea, whilst I was speaking in prayer, let me just stop right here and throw this out. This is the same Daniel they, they threw in the lion's den because he had the audacity to pray three times a day. He opened his window and he prayed toward Jerusalem, toward the holy mountain of God, three times a day. If you won't pray in adversity, I mean, if you won't pray when there is no adversity, when adversity comes, you won't have a prayer life. And don't expect God to show you anything if you don't ever talk to him. Hmm? All right, this is the same Daniel. And of course, this is after he come out of the lion's den. But listen to what he said, verse 21. <clears throat> Yea, while I was speaking in prayer, even the man Gabriel. If you study your Bible, you understand Gabriel is one of the archangels. Now keep in mind, they didn't have a completed copy of the Word of God. Daniel was not indwelled by the Holy Spirit of God. You and I are. We have a copy of the Word of God. God don't send Gabriel to talk to you and me. He's given us the Word of God and the Spirit of God. But see, Daniel didn't have all that. But God still got a message to him. All right? And by the way, this isn't about Gabriel. This is about the message. It's never about the messenger. It's always about the message. Now look up what he says. Even the man Gabriel, whom I had seen in the vision at the beginning, being caused to fly swiftly, touched me about the time of the evening oblation. And he informed me and talked with me and said, O Daniel, I am now come forth to give thee skill and understanding. At the beginning of thy supplications, the commandment came forth, and I am come to show thee, for thou art greatly beloved. Therefore, understand the matter and consider the vision. Verse 24 is very important. Seventy weeks are determined upon thy people. Who was his people? The Jews. And upon thy holy city to finish the transgression and to make an end of sins and to make reconciliation for iniquity and to bring into everlasting righteousness and to seal up the vision and prophecy and to anoint the most holy. Know therefore and understand that from the going forth of the commandment to restore and to build Jerusalem unto the Messiah, the Prince, shall be seven weeks and threescore and two weeks. 
the street shall be built again, and the wall, and even in troubles, troublous times. Now understand, seven weeks and three score and two weeks. Three score and two weeks, you know, is 62, plus seven is 69. Keep that in mind, all right? Uh, he goes on to say in verse 26, And after three score and two weeks shall Messiah be cut off, but not for himself, and the people of the prince that shall come shall destroy the city and the sanctuary, and the end thereof shall be with a flood, and unto the end of the war desolations are determined. And he shall confirm the covenant with many for one week, and in the midst of the week he shall cause the sacrifice and the oblation to cease, and from the overspreading of abominations he shall make it desolate even until the consummation and that determined shall be poured upon the desolate. Now here we find there's a 70 week vision. He said that there will be 69 weeks uh, from the building of Jerusalem until the Messiah the Prince. Then he said uh, in verse 26, after the three, three score and two weeks, the 69 weeks, the Messiah shall be cut off, but not for himself. And he goes on to say that the city and the sanctuary shall be destroyed. Then he goes on in verse 27 and says, uh, uh, there be a covenant with many for one week, and in the midst of the week he shall cause the sacrifice and the oblation to cease. Now let me put all that in perspective for you. One week here means seven years. If you go and you do the math, seven years for the 69 weeks, from the time Daniel got this vision until Jesus rode the coat into Jerusalem four days before they crucified him is exactly 69 weeks. Then it said the Messiah would be cut off. He was crucified. Then he said the city and the temple would be destroyed. And it was. And then he said there will be a week. And he said in that week, it it how did they put it in verse 27? In the midst of the week shall he cause the sacrifice and the oblation to cease. Now we're talking about a week, seven years. The 69 weeks came to pass with Jerusalem, with Israel. And Israel didn't become a nation again until 1948. The week that it's talking about, verse 27, is yet to come to pass. That week is referring to the great tribulation period. And he said, in the midst of the week shall the sacrifice and oblation end. That seven-year period is divided into two periods. I'll get to that in a second. All right, So we see Daniel's 70th week vision, the 70th week, hasn't come to pass. That is the time of Jacob's trouble. That is the time that in chapter 12 is a time of trouble. Okay? Now, the Great Tribulation ought to be divided into two periods, 42 months each, 30 or three and a half years for each one. Uh, Revelation chapter 11 tells us that, verse number 2. Uh, but the court which is without the temple leave out and measure it not for it is given unto the Gentiles and the holy city shall they tread underfoot forty and two months three and a half years verse three and I will give power unto my two witnesses and they shall prophesy a thousand two hundred and three score days you add up a thousand three hundred and two score days it's three and a half years and they shall be clothed in sackcloth so there's two three and a half year periods all right now, during the great tribulation period, the wrath of God and the judgment of God shall be poured out on this earth like it is never seen. Those are outlined beginning in chapter 6 of the book of Revelation. Turn there with me. There are seven seals to be broken and seven trumpets. The wrath and the judgment of God are represented in these seals and these trumpets. 
I'm not going to read all of chapter 6, I'm not going to read all the, but I'm going to show you these seals and what they represent and what will happen. In chapter number 6, in verse number 2, verse 1, the Lord tells John, come and see what's about to happen. In chapter 2, it says, And I, be, I saw and behold a white horse, and he that sat on him had a bow, and a crown was given upon him, and he went forth conquering and to conquer. The Bible lets us know that Satan himself can be translated into an angel of light. Satan has always sought to imitate the things of Christ. Jesus is the bright morning star. Satan's referred to as the son of the morning. He's always a little lower than Jesus, but he always tries to imitate Jesus. The Lord has a church and a bride. Satan is working on his church and his bride. By the way, does anybody remember who Alice Cooper was? Tommy, raise both hands. Alice Cooper was a, what we used to call a hard rock and roll singer. He sang hard rock, acid rock. Uh, most people don't listen to Alice Cooper was high on something. Okay? Alice Cooper was evil. I know that because he sang with a boa constrictor around his neck. You know how I feel about snakes. Anybody that gets on a stage with one wrapped around his neck and that thing doesn't strangle you, you're a devil. Okay? Just thought I'd throw that out. I got in the truck today to leave church, go to the house for a little bit, and, and I had the radio on when I clicked on the thing, and, and all of a sudden there's a commercial advertising some new streaming outfit, you know, about eerie stuff and weird people, and Alice Cooper is on there. And Alice Cooper said this. He said, I don't believe in ghosts. He says there's no such thing. He said, there are demons who portray themselves as ghosts because the devil has always tried to imitate something else that is acceptable. Now, when a fellow who is a devil worshiper tells you something about the devil, you better pay attention. Now, what amazes me, there are many Christians who believe in ghosts but don't believe in demon possession. Here's a guy who's possessed and tells you there's no such thing as ghosts, but demons who are acting like ghosts. You ought to pay attention to that. Hmm? All right. Now, I said all that to say the devil has always tried to imitate the things of the Lord. Always. You've got to be careful when you read after commentators. Commentators many times use human reasoning to give you definition to Scripture. Again, the best commentary on the Bible is the Bible itself. In Revelation 19, when we get to it, when we talk about the second coming of the Lord, He's coming back on a white horse. You and I that are saved, we're coming back with Him. We're going to be on a white horse too. High ho silver, here we come. Okay? And we'll show you all that in the Scripture. When the Lord comes back, He's going to have many crowns on His head. And he's coming back to put an end to the battle of, the, of Armageddon, which we will get to, when he will destroy all the nations fighting against Israel. He's coming to conquer. So if you as a natural man, read verse number 2, you see somebody on a white horse with a crown who's coming to conquer, and there are commentators will tell you that's the Lord Jesus. They're wrong. Makes sense to the natural man. That fellow on that white horse with a crown, with a bow, who's coming to conquer, is the Antichrist. The Lord is not coming back at the beginning of the wrath to witness it all. The Lord is coming back to end it all. The one who is coming who will institute the wrath is the Antichrist. Now, notice, if you will, uh, what happens. We find in verse number 4, 
It says that there went out another horse that was red, and the power was given to him that sat thereon to take peace from the earth, and that they should kill one another, and there was given unto him a great sword. We find that when this seal is broken, war is going to break out amongst the world. Now again, in Matthew 24, assigned to the Jews, the Bible says this in verse 6, And ye shall hear of wars and rumors of wars. See that ye be not troubled, for all these things must come to pass, but the end is not yet. This is one of the first seals broken. War. Now look with me down in verse number 5. And when he had opened the third seal, I heard the third beast say, Come and see, and I beheld, and lo, a black horse. And he that sat on him had a pair of balances in his hands, and I heard a, a voice in the midst of the four beasts say, A measure of wheat for a penny, and three measures of barley for a penny, and see thou hurt not the oil and the wine. We find here this black horse represents famine. Hmm? Notice uh, they put a measure and amount on food. They said, don't mess with the wine. Isn't it amazing liquor stores weren't closed, but churches were? I just find it amazing. Just the coincidence. That just, just, just happened to happen. Hmm? Can I say it's easy to control people as long as you make sure they're addicted to something. Addicted to fear, addicted to drugs, addicted to money, addicted to filthy lucre, addicted to peace. Uh, you, you get people where you can control them, they'll do whatever you say. Just throwing that out, huh? You know why they didn't close the alcohol, the liquor stores? Because they knew people would go insane without their booze. They knew they'd have a real epidemic in America. They knew they didn't have the hospitals to put people detoxing. Just thought I'd throw that out there. Okay. Uh, look with me back in Revelation uh, chapter 6. Look in verse number 8. And I looked, and behold, a pale horse. And his name that sat on him was Death. And hell followed with him. And all power was given unto him over the fourth part of the earth to kill with sword and with hunger and with death and with the beast of the earth. When this plague is opened up, this seal was broken, a quarter of the earth's population will be destroyed. Hmm? He'll use whatever means to kill people. Again, in Matthew 24, verse 7, For nation shall rise against nation, kingdom against kingdom. There shall be famines and pestilences and earthquakes and divers places, and all these are the beginning of sorrows. These things are just beginning to happen. Look in verse 11. <clears throat> we find the fifth seal is broken up. Verse 10, And they cried with a loud voice, saying, How long, O Lord, holy and true, dost thou not judge and avenge our blood on them that dwell on the earth? And white robes were given unto every one of them, and it was said unto them that they should rest yet for a little season until their fellow servants, also their brethren, uh, that shall be killed as they were, should be fulfilled. Mm, this seal is martyrs. Now these are not the martyrs, that happened in the early church age. These are people that will be killed during the great tribulation period. You remember a minute ago I told you in order to buy and sell and get gain you had to have the mark of the beast? If you don't have the mark of the beast you're going to be hunted down and killed. You will be deplorables. You will be the off scour of the world. I don't want to get ahead of myself with the Antichrist, but do you know, really, between here and Indianapolis, there's a, a, a dog race track out there, and there's a National Guard Readiness Center uh, on 74, just before you get to Indianapolis out there. Do you know behind that racetrack out there, there's Black Hawk helicopters fly over all day long. Do you, do you know they, are, they have concentration camps there? Now, why would they have to put people in America in concentration camps? Could it be folks that refuse to take a, virus, a vaccine? 
Could it be folks that refuse to take the mark of the beast? Hmm? By the way, how's that buying ammo working for you? Do you know why America's never been attacked on American soil? Other than 9-11. Because they know every redneck's got, got weapons. The Second Amendment allows us to call for a ready militia at any time. What good's a gun if you don't have any ammo? It's a paperweight. Deputy Foster's here. Ask him. The sheriff put in a big order back over the summer. They told him we can't get it until next September. That's the police. Do you think it was any accident when COVID hit, they closed down all the ammo manufacturing plants? And who bought it all up? Just causing you to think a little bit. Hmm? What martyrs is it talking about? Well, if you look over in chapter 12 of Revelation, look at verse 11. It's talking about tribulation martyrs. Verse 10 said, And I heard a loud voice saying in heaven, Now is come salvation and strength in the kingdom of our God and the power of his Christ. For the accuser of the brethren is cast down, which accursed them before our God day and night. Now look at verse 11. And they overcame him by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of their testimony, and they loved not their lives unto the death. Tribulation saints rejected the mark of the beast. They loved Christ and not their own life because they were killed for their faith. You know how I know we're not living in the tribulation period? We're not having to die for our faith. We were told to go on live stream and there are some people that still haven't come back to some churches. That's not persecution. Hmm? Look with me in verse number 12. It said, I beheld, and he opened the sixth seal, and lo, there was a great earthquake, and the sun became black as sackcloth uh, of hair, and the moon became as blood, and the stars of heaven fell into the earth, even as a fig tree casteth, casteth her untimely figs when she is shaken in the mighty wind. And the heaven departed as a scroll when it is rolled together and every mountain and island were removed out of their places uh, and the kings of the earth and great men and rich men and chief captains and mighty men and every bond man every man and, and every free man hid themselves in dens and in rocks and in mountains and said to the mountains and rocks fall on us and hide us from the face of him that sitteth on the throne and from the wrath of the lamb the sixth seal shows there will be total chaos all the elements of nature will be unleashed. Earthquakes, hailstorms, sandstorms, tornadoes. Uh, that will all transpire because the sun and the moon are darkened. You do know that the tidal waves and all that is, is affected by the, the lunar, the moon. And all that's going to th be thrown out of, out, of, uh, out of course. And then it talks about... Uh, uh, hail falling from heaven and, and it's talking about meteors are going to start hitting this earth this thing is absolutely uh, going to be in total chaos so much that from the most noble to the biggest pauper they're all going to run and hide themselves in caves and dens flee from the wrath of God it's coming now a lot of these things are already being portrayed on Hollywood to desensitize people to them you know, I love that movie, Independence Day. Hmm? I love that movie. At the beginning, you know, when, when them aliens start showing up, big gigantic meteors start hitting New York City and everything. everybody's freaking out. What in the world's going on? It's all just desensitizing people. That's something out of their control is happening. All right? Uh, look with me. I don't have time to get in Chapter 7. Maybe we'll look at Chapter 7 next week. I've, I've rambled way too much. Chapter 7 shows people that will be saved out of the tribulation period. We'll get into this next week because if somebody's heard the gospel, 
The Bible says God will bring strong delusion on them to where they'll believe alive. If they've heard the gospel and rejected Jesus Christ during the church age, then they'll have no chance of being saved during the tribulation period. They'll take the mark of the beast, they'll be damned. But there's a lot of folks that haven't heard the gospel. There are whole nations with billions of people that have never heard a clear-cut presentation of the gospel. God being a just God, a righteous God, will give them an opportunity to trust in Christ. Plus, this is all about purging Israel. And we find in chapter 7, there will be 12,000 from each 12 tribes of Israel, 144,000 Jews that are coming out of the Great Tribulation period. Plus, the Bible says in chapter 7, a great number that no man can number is coming out. They're not going to take the mark of the beast. They'll put their faith in whatever God chooses. Remember we talked last week about dispensations. And in every dispensation, God had a way for man to come to God. We're in the grace age now. We're saved by grace through faith. During the tribulation period, God will have a way or system where people can put their faith in Him, and God's grace will be imputed unto them. There will be a great number, as we find in chapter 7, that no man can number. There will be people to be saved, just not people that have heard the gospel. If you have loved ones that have heard the gospel, you better get them under the gospel. Because we've just looked at a little wrath. Chapter 8 starts showing the judgments. In chapter 8, Verse number 7, the Bible says, The first angel sounded, and there followed hail and fire mingled with blood. And they were cast upon the earth, and a third part of the trees was burnt up, and the green grass was burnt up. We find in the first judgment, vegetation life is destroyed on the earth. So much for the tree huggers and the grass eaters. No more tofu. It's all gone. It's at all the grass third of the trees do you realize we get our oxygen from the trees hmm? you think folks got allergy problems now hmm? the second judgment in chapter 8 it says in, in verse number 8 and the second angel sounded as it were a great mountain burning with fire was cast into the sea and the third part of the sea became blood and the third part of the creatures that were in the sea uh, and had life died and a third part of the ships were destroyed not a good day to be on the ocean when that judgment comes third of all the sea life gone hmm? no more crab legs no more shrimp hmm? you don't like seafood get right with God and you, you, you'd understand uh, a third of the ships that are on the sea destroyed hmm? look at the fourth judgment or the third judgment the Bible said in verse 10 the third angel sounded and there was a great star from heaven burning as it was a lamp another great meteor and it fell upon the third part of the rivers and upon the fountains of water and the name of the star was called Wormwood and the third part of the waters became Wormwood and many men died of the waters because they were made bitter the waters are contaminated listen you can live without tofu you can't live without water Hmm. the Bible said another third of the men or it said many men died there's another place in here you'll find where another third of the population the population 25% was already destroyed now another third is going to be destroyed look what it says in the fourth trumpet and the fourth angel sounded and the third part of the sun was smitten and the third part of the moon and the third part of the stars and the third part of them was darkened and the day shone not for a third part of it and, not, and the night likewise and beheld I heard an angel flying through the midst of heaven saying with a loud voice woe 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 to the inhabitants of the earth by reason of other voices of the trumpet and the angels uh, of the three angels were, were yet to sound darkness on the earth there are medicinal purposes in the sunlight alone people that are exposed to long periods of darkness great depression sets in In chapter number 9, we find the fifth trumpet. If nothing else I've said, what I'm about to say ought to cause you to get a burden, get a hold of God, and start witnessing to your loved ones. 
Because what is about to come, we have never, ever experienced in this world. And the fifth angel, angel sounded, and I saw a star fall from heaven unto the earth. And to him was given the key to the, of the bottomless pit. And he opened the bottomless pit, and there rose a smoke out of the pit. And as the smoke of a great furnace, and the sun and the air were darkened by reason of the smoke of the pit, and there came out of the smoke locusts upon the earth, and to them was given power, as the scorpions of the earth have power, and it was commanded them that they should not hurt the grass of the earth, nor, neither any green thing, neither any tree, but only those men which have not the seal of God in their foreheads. And to them it was given that they should ki not kill them, but that they should be tormented five months uh, and their torment uh, as the torment of a scorpion when he striketh a man. And in those days men shall seek death and shall not find it, and shall desire to die, and death shall flee from them. And the shapes of the locusts were like unto horses prepared unto battle, and their heads were as crowns like gold, and their faces were as faces of men, and they had hair as the hair of women, and their teeth were as the teeth of lion and lions, and they had breastplates as it were breastplates of iron, and the sounds of their wings was the sounds of chariot, many horses running to battle, and they had tails like unto scorpion, and there were, uh, were stings in their tails, and their power was to hurt men five months. Sounds to me like you can't kill them boogers. But they are setting out to torment those who do not have the mark in their hands or foreheads. Can I say something about these beasts? They come out of the bottomless pit. Bottomless pit is the abyss. Remember when Jesus cast those demons out of that man, referred to as legion because he had many demons? And they, they bid Jesus not to cast them in the pit, but to cast them into the swine, and then the swine violently ran and hurt. You know why they didn't want to be in the pit? Because once you go to the pit, you don't get out. See, for a demon, in order to affect anything in this world, he has to have a body. And they threw them demons in the pits, so they're there. These are demons dressed like some kind of supernatural scorpion that are going to inflict pain and punishment. And do you notice that it said these demonic locusts hit these people and they didn't die? Death was removed. Sometimes death would be a blessing. How many times have you said, boy, I don't want to see my loved one suffer? These people suffer like suffering we've never heard of. Now look at verse 11. And they had a king over them, which is the angel of the bottomless pit, whose name in the Hebrew tongue is Abaddon, and in the Greek tongue hath his name Apollyon. Abaddon and Apollyon mean one thing, destroyer. You know what destroyer is another name of for? Satan. That's their king. Hmm? Let's finish up these last two trumpets. We'll close this thing down tonight. I know I've been long, but there's a lot of information. Verse 13. And the sixth angel sounded, and I heard the voice from the four horns of the golden altar, which is before God, saying to the sixth angel, which hath the trumpet, Loose the four angels which are bound in the great river Euphrates. And the four angels were loosed, which were prepared for an hour and a day and a month and a year for to slay the third part of men. And the number of the army of the horsemen were two hundred thousand thousand, and I heard the number of them. And I saw the horses in the vision, and them that sat upon them having breastplates of fire and of Jason and of brimstone, and the heads of the horses were as heads of lions, uh, and out of their mouth issued fire and smoke and brimstone. By these three was the third part of men killed by fire and by smoke and by brimstone, which issued out of their mouths. These are wicked angels. These wicked angels are bound under the great river Euphrates. If you look at great river of Euphrates up, it is referring to the bottomless pit. These angels, these wicked angels, have been bound in the bottomless pit. Now we, and we'll get to it, we'll see it. Satan's going to be bound in the bottomless pit for a thousand years during the millennial reign of Christ. 
Once you're bound there, you don't get out, but they're let out. Just like Satan will be let out for a season. We'll bring that out. What are these great wicked angels? I don't know. They could have been those angels because Jude tells us about some who are reserved to the day of judgment. It could have been those wicked demons that had relations with women back in Jeremiah, uh, uh, back in Genesis, and uh, their relations brought forth giants in the land. I don't know. But those, those, those demons were bound in the bottomless pit. These wicked demons are unloosed. And it said, with 200,000, that means an unlimited number of other demons come with them, and they're going to destroy another third of the population of the earth. Friend, we've got to reach folks with the gospel. This is coming. It's on the horizon. Somebody's got the key to the chains of these in the bottom's pit, about ready to put it in the lock and loose them. The final trumpet of God's wrath. You'll find in chapter number 11, the last verse. Verse 19. And the temple of God was opened in heaven, and there was seen in his temple the ark of his testament, and there were lightnings and voices and thunderings and an earthquake and great hail. You see God's wrath poured out in its fullness in the seventh trumpet. I say all that to say this. The seven seals and the seven trumpets are all unleashed in the first three and a half years of the great tribulation. And for the mid-trippers who say that we'll be here through all that, they're lying. God has delivered us from that mess. It's one of the benefits of being saved by grace. We're taken out of here before all that mess comes out. Next week, Lord willing, we'll study in great detail the Antichrist. We'll study his characteristics, what the Bible says about him, what was prophesied about him. What Daniel said about him. What Paul said about him. What Revelation reveals about him. We'll look at this booger, and I'm convinced somewhere on this earth he's alive. Now let me say this and I'll be done. There are forces in this world that run this world that you've never heard of. There is a secret society called the Illuminati. And every major player behind the scenes running the world is a part of the Illuminati. They're the ones who pick who's going to be the president. They're the ones who pick the leaders of Europe. They're the ones who designate how this earth's going to be run. And they're the ones behind trying to steal this election. The American people aren't for what the Illuminati's for. And if you think Biden's going to be president, you're crazy. Even if they give him the office, he's not going to stay there long. Because the one the Illuminati wants could have never gotten elected by this crowd, the American people. I'm just trying to tell you, this thing's coming to a close. In Daniel's vision, Nebuchadnezzar got the dream, and Na Daniel gives the interpretation of, and, and this great image from the head to the feet represents world empires. By the time it gets down to the end, there's ten toes. It's a united federation of European countries. Ten of them. Make no mistake, with Brexit and all that's going on in Europe right now, and them against England, and, and, and Greece's economy falling, and everything. All the dominoes are coming into place where there'll be a ten kingdom federation which will uh, anoint the Antichrist as their king. I say all that to say this. Nowhere in prophecy do you find the United States of America. The best you can find, Ezekiel talks about whelps of the lion. And the lion represented England, and it's the nations that came off of England. Uh, the most powerful nation in the universe right now doesn't sound like a whelp to me. 
So that means America must fall. And my dear friends, America's headed for a fall. And so is this world. It's time. If we're ever going to do something for God, we get about doing it. If we're ever going to see revival, we need to have it. If we're ever going to get serious, we need to get serious. Every one of us know people out of the will of God. Every one of us know people that have heard the gospel and haven't gotten saved. There'll be no hope for them unless we reach them, unless we pray for them, unless we get a burden for them, unless we become what Christians should already be. God help us. This thing's winding down. The great tribulation period's just on the horizon, just like the rapture of the church. Matter of fact, the devil's crowd's more ready for the tribulation than God's people are ready for the rapture. Next week, we'll look at the Antichrist and how he'll rule and reign during the tribulation period. All right, I'm done. Miss Renee, come to the piano. Tonight might be a good night on this Christmas Eve Eve for you to get a burden for people that aren't ready to meet the Lord. Maybe you got somebody in your family that's not saved. You ought to come pray for them. If God does not grant us another space of grace in America and Biden becomes president, I'm here to tell you the things we're talking about will come to pass much quicker than you could ever imagine. God help us get serious about the things of God. She's playing. Folks are praying. Let's pray. Father, we bless you. Lord, these things are scary. Not for us as the child of God. We know we'll never experience it. But it's scary because we know people who are not ready to meet you. God, I pray. Lord, that we become more than essential. I pray that folks would turn to the church as the only means of help in this dire world. Through the church, may they be introduced to Jesus, the way, the truth, and the life. God, I pray lives will be changed. Lord, just as they put that roundabout there and people just going around in circles, that's what this world is. Folks just going around in circles, not even knowing where they're headed. God, help us, Lord, to be revived. Break our hearts for sinners. Break our hearts for righteousness. Break our hearts to do business with God in such a way like Daniel did that we hear from heaven and we can impact this world. God, I pray for those that aren't ready to meet you. I pray for those that have heard the gospel and rejected it. God, in your long suffering, you'd give them another opportunity. I pray for those that claim to be saved, but Lord, they just are really disenfranchised with the church and the gospel and the things of God. God, I pray you'd open their eyes. Help them to know that our salvation is nearer than when we believed, that there are souls in the balance. Bless now. Help these in the, in, the, in the altar tonight. Get glory to your name. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thanks to listeners like you, IBC has had over 100,000 views on our YouTube channel. If you haven't already, subscribe today. And as always, thanks for listening.